Good afternoon, and welcome to the Student Town Hall on course delivery for fall 2020. We know that a lot of you have concerns about what instruction will look like when you return for the fall if you take face-to-face -face classes. You have concerns about what online instruction is going to look like. We're going to answer those questions for you today. But first, we want to, um, I want to introduce you to the Chancellor Johnson O. Akinlay, the best chancellor at NCCU. I'm a little biased, but he's the best. Um, and he would like to talk with you um, about returning for the fall. And Chancellor, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Good afternoon to all of our students. Um, we want to thank you for joining us this, this evening. Uh, let me say to you that we miss all of you in person, and we can't wait uh, to have you back uh, on campus in August. Uh, as you all know, our number one priority is our students, and your number one priority is student success. So we are eager to have you back on campus, and we're going to do everything within our power to make sure that you're safe, to make, your, to make sure that the campus is safe, to make sure that, you know, um, we keep all of our constituents and community members to keep them safe. And so on behalf of you, the students, the faculty, the staff, and our alumni, our board of trustees, I want to say to you all that uh, uh, we are eager uh, to have you and to welcome you back to uh, the fall semester in August. Uh, I know you have uh, a number of uh, uh, presenters this evening, led by Dr. Anderson, our provost, but I want to talk to you briefly, just, just briefly about certain expectations as you come back to campus. I don't have to remind you how serious the coronavirus is because I'm sure that you are watching the news, you're listening to what is happening around the nation and around the world. This is a very serious pandemic. And when I say serious, not just for you, uh, for your family members, for your friends, and for all of us. So I want us to understand the magnitude of what we're dealing with. But unfortunately, we can't stay away forever. We've got to find a way to begin to work and to get back to work and to get back to campus while we are following all of the guidelines that have been prescribed by CDC uh, so that we can be safe. So I want to assure you that all of the panelists that you'll be talking to tonight will tell you aspects of our preparation that we are making that will keep you safe when you return to the campus. But the most important thing I'm going to say to you as a student and as an individual is personal responsibility. In order for all of us to be safe, we all have to be responsible. And when I say responsible, that means that in order for me to be safe, I have to keep you safe. In order for you to be safe, I need to keep you safe. And so when we come back together as a community, we're going to have to look out for each other. That means that all of us I mean, all of us have to follow all of the guidelines and the protocols that have been established for us in our housing unit, in the classroom, in the dining hall, in the library, in our retail shops, as we walk around the campus, so that we all can be safe. I will say to you, students, please do accept responsibility. Please do take responsibility. I cannot protect you if you are not going to take responsibility. What do I mean by that? If we are not to have gatherings more than 10, let's not do that. If we are required to wear masks in order to protect ourselves, let's do it. We don't want to take things why you may be healthy, why you may not, you may be not asymptomatic, we don't want you to take anything back to your friends or to your parents or to your loved ones. So the key for us to have a successful semester in a successful campus when you come back 
is going to be that we all follow the guidelines that have been prescribed for us and that the, our team has been working on uh, for the last uh, uh, several weeks. But I can assure you, as Chancellor, that our utmost priority on campus with our staff, with our faculty, is to keep you safe. And we will do everything, everything within our power to make sure that you're safe. So tonight, please do pay attention. Ask great questions. And I want to say to you, do not be frustrated because this pandemic is serious. We don't know everything yet that needs to be known about this virus. And we're learning every day. So even our best plan today, tomorrow we may adjust it as we know more, as we gain more knowledge about it. So what I would say to you is be patient, ask questions, and let's be accommodating of others. So I want to thank you for being patient. Uh, we've been in this. I can assure you that this is not going to be forever. But for now, this is the new normal that we have to follow. So I wish you all the best. Uh, we all look forward to having you back on campus. We miss you on campus. And so we are excited that uh, you'll be coming back and we do everything in our power to make sure that you're safe. So please remember, personal responsibility is going to be the obligation that we ask all of us to fulfill. Thank you so much. And I want to turn it over back to Dr. Anderson. I see Dr. Pullman and all of the deans are here this evening and they will be glad to take, uh, to respond to all of your questions. Dr. Anderson, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, I neglected to introduce myself. I'm Landa Anderson, Interim Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. And I want to thank Dr. Angela Coleman, who is the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, for allowing us this opportunity to share additional information um, with you. As I indicated, we know that you have questions, but we want you to know that we a lot of work has gone into planning for the fall semester to make sure that you have the best experience, that your educational experience is not compromised in the least. During the um, session today, you're going to hear some information is going to be repeated or could be repeated in the presentation. That really means it's important and it's something that you really need to know and to keep in mind as you navigate through the semester. So before I um, you hear from the presenters, and I'm not going to be a presenter tonight, um, I want to introduce to you the deans and some other individuals who are on this call, starting with uh, Dr. Carlton Wilson, who is the interim dean of the newly formed College of Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities. Um, dean Wilson, can you wave at us and say hello or something briefly? Good evening, everyone. Great. Um, Dr. Laverne Reed, who is the interim dean of the new College of Health, of Health and Sciences, she was having problems getting on. I'm not sure if she's on. Okay, we're moving down the road. Um, Dr. Anthony Nelson, who's the dean of the School of Business. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Dr. Audrey Beard, dean of the School of Education. Good evening, how's everyone? Welcome. Dr. John Gant, who is Dean of the School of Library and Information Sciences. Hi, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Great. Um, Dr. Bounty Lewis, who joined us in June as a Dean of the School of Law. I'm not sure if she was on. Um, also, Dr. Joseph Green, who's Dean of University College. Good evening. I can't see you, Dr. Green. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And also on Dr. Theodosia Shields, who's director of the James E. Shepherd Library. Mike, I'm not sure if she's on or not, but we invited her to join us just in case there are questions about the library. And also joining us on the call as a, um, a faculty member is Dr. Catherine Weimer, who is professor in the Department of Language and Literature. So um, she might have the opportunity to share some questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the presenters. 
Um, the next slide will show the agenda. It's ambitious, but we feel like it is information that everybody that you really need to hear. So, take it away, Dean Wilson and Dr. Rose. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, next up, uh, yes. I'm sorry. I neglected to introduce sorry, Dr. Jalera Zay, who is Associate Provost and Dean of the School of Graduate Studies. Please forgive me, Dr. Zay. Please say hello. No problem. Good evening, everyone. Okay. Yeah, I'll be back in a minute. Okay. I'm done. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, good evening, everyone, once again. Uh, as the Chancellor noted, our number one priority this fall is the health and safety of all of our students, faculty, and staff. And at the same time, we would like to deliver effective teaching so that we can have effective learning this fall. During the fall semester, you will pr primarily encounter three modes of course delivery. There will be the traditional face-to-face, -face, there will be hybrid classes, and there will be online classes. So there will be three primary modes of course instruction this fall. Next slide, please. So let's first briefly talk about face-to-face -face classes, our most traditional form of instruction. According to guidelines issued by the University of North Carolina system, when you start thinking about face-to-face -face classes for the fall, we can only have classes that reach up to 40% capacity of the normal classroom space. So therefore, if you have 20 students or 20 seats in a particular class, you can only have 40% capacity. So face-to-face -face classes will be impacted by class location. For classes that are large, we will, we're working very hard to move these classes to classrooms that can safely accommodate the students at 40% capacity. Each classroom will have designating seating where students can sit. There will be chairs that will be marked that will be also off limits. When we think about the 40% capacity and we think about face-to-face -face classes, when we look at our course schedules, clearly many of our lower level classes with large enrollments face-to-face uh, -face may not be the best option. However, in some of our upper division courses that customarily have low enrollment or more traditional enrollment, face-to-face -face classes may well be scheduled, as well as for some of our graduate classes that tend to have enrollment anywhere from five students to maybe 10 or 15 students in our major colleges in our more professional schools, of course, the enrollment is larger. All face-to-face -face classes will be conducted in classrooms where we can maintain the three to six feet social distancing that is recommended by the UNC system and the CDC. Each class will have a seating chart, attendance will be taken each class meeting, and as the chancellor noted, you know, according to the university guidelines, all faculty and students may be required to wear masks if they're attending a face-to-face -face class. These classrooms will be cleaned on a daily basis and cleaning materials will be available throughout the day in all of these classrooms where we are conducting face-to-face -face classes, our most traditional form of instruction. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We move to the next slide. Two. seconds the system is freezing so give us okay. one moment
Well, as we are preparing to move the presentation forward, we can talk about online instruction, okay? Which is our next mode of instruction that we will be participating in the fall. We fully expect at NCCU in the fall to have at least 60% of all of our classes will be taught online, at least 60% or more. All faculty are preparing to offer their courses within the Blackboard instructional platform. Many of our students are very familiar with this. We've used Blackboard for several years. Of course, in March, all of our classes will transition to Blackboard. So that will be the primary mode of online instruction. However, some instructors, some classes will also use additional uh, platforms, instructional platforms. There will be uh, instructors who will use WebEx. Uh, there will be instructors who may use Zoom. So there are a variety of instructional technology that will supplement online instruction. There will be courses that will be uh, used live streaming uh, in order to bring to students that type of up to the minute, second by second uh, instruction. Clearly, as we talk about online delivery, uh, all of our faculty are working very, very hard, have been working hard since March to improve online instruction. Many of them have been involved in workshops and symposium that offer them the best opportunity to be able to offer effective instruction in the fall via online instructional technology. Of course, critical to this is for students to have access to the technology. So for those students who will be on campus in the fall, access to internet, access to the proper hardware, laptops and Chromebooks that will be necessary in order to engage effectively in online instruction. And we want to place emphasis on engagement. Faculty are being trained daily how to effectively interact and engage with students via online instruction. And we want students to be prepared for this. From day one, it is very, very important to consistently engage with your teachers, to interact with your, your classmates in order to take full advantage of what we have to offer with our instructional technology. Just like normal and face-to-face -face classes, attendance will be taken daily, uh, and the expectations is that faculty and students will have that type of daily class contact in terms of online. But student interaction, student engagement is critical, okay? Our third mode of instruction for the fall will come between face-to-face -face and online, and that is hybrid, hybrid. Whether a professor offers a hybrid course primarily depends upon the subject matter. It depends upon the number of students who are enrolled in that particular class, and also the classroom capability to be able to accommodate that number of students. We have a considerable number of faculty who do okay. want, to offer, right, so what who, who want to offer online instruction. However, they also value some face-to-face -face time with their students. So this takes us to the hybrid model. Uh, and it would be very, very important for students to understand what does hybrid mean for every particular class that is going to be taught that way. It could be different from professor to professor. For example, some professors operating within the hybrid model will divide their classes. Let's say on Tuesday, half of the class will come to the class face to face. The other half will be online. On Thursday, you will switch roles. The students who are online on Tuesday will come to class face to face. Those who were face to face on Tuesday, on Thursday, they will be online. That is a hybrid model. In addition, in some of our STEM areas, 
the lectures will be online, but the labs may be face-to-face. -face. That is a hybrid model, okay? So our professors are preparing the, that type of instruction to complement other things that they will be doing. Please know that instructors will notify you if your that class is going to be hybrid, and they will explain to you well in advance uh, what does hybrid mean for that particular section? Once again, very critical in operating under the hybrid environment is to have consistent interaction and engagement from day one until the end of the class. So therefore, when you return to NCCU in August, three primary modes of instruction, face-to-face, -face, the traditional, online, and hybrid. We are confident that we will be able to effectively teach and you will be able to effectively learn via these three modes of instruction. And please be assured that throughout the summer, over 600 faculty members are working very hard to ensure that they are ready to offer you the best instruction possible when you return to class on August 24th. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to actually pull the um, original slide because we're still not, it's not progressing on your screen, right? Okay, so give us a second. We're downloading it and then we can run it ourselves. So give us two seconds. So can I take this opportunity, I want to take this opportunity to introduce to the folks that I missed the last time, um, Dr. Laverne Reed, who is the Interim Dean of New College of Health and Sciences, is on the line. Greetings. I look forward to having you on campus and online in August. Take care. Thank you. And Dr. Theodosia Shields, who is the Director of the Shepherd Library. Good evening. Welcome. So glad to be with you. Thank you, Dr. Shields. I think that's all I missed. Okay. Hello again, um, everyone. So I'm going to talk about um, additional days of instruction. So because we have shortened the semester, we have added some additional days of instruction to make sure you are getting the same amount of instruction as in a regular semester, except for the law students whose semester has not been shortened. These additional days are the fall break and 10 days as listed on this slide. Um, the fall break, um, there will be re regular instruction, which means that this Monday and Tuesday will be just like all the other Mondays and Tuesdays. So if you have class on Monday, you will have class on this Monday as well. Now, on the list of Saturdays, which are the 10 Saturdays, all your classes will be meeting online in an asynchronous format. So what does asynchronous format mean? If you go to the next slide, please. As you can see uh, on this table, in an asynchronous course, you will receive information from your professor via Blackboard, email, etc. And you can review the material on your own. So, for example, if you have registered for four courses that meet at different days and times during the week, 
with different delivery modes that uh, Dr. Wilson just um, uh, explained. You will receive instruction material on Saturdays for each of those four courses. There will not be any class meeting. So there won't be any time conflict between your courses. The type of Saturday instructional material and how it will be delivered to you will be determined by your instructor and will be listed on the course syllabus. Next, um, we, I would like to talk about, if you go to the next slide, please. I'd like to talk about internship, clinical rotations, practical, and student teaching. Each department that requires these type of courses is very busy making plans for them. And these plans vary by department. The plans are updated almost weekly as new information regarding COVID-19 come out. Another challenge with these type of courses is that the department must coordinate with the sites selected for the experience. A lot of sites may have reduced the number of students they take. Some sites allow only virtual um, participation. So there are two very important things for you to keep in mind. One is to be flexible. As I said, these plans are going to change constantly based on the new information, based on the changes that the sites are making, based on um, the material that needs to be covered in the course with each one of the departments. So be flexible. And the second thing that's very important is communication. Make sure that you, are, the communication goes both ways. So if information are sent to you, make sure that you are checking your emails regularly, you contact your advisor. If you're not hearing from them, you have questions, don't hesitate to uh, call the department, call your advisor and get as much information as you can. Now, here are some examples. So if you go to the next slide, um, these are based on uh, what I just said. You may be able to get your internship, practicum, student teaching as you normally would uh, with working on site. However, the number of these types of opportunities will be low. So be patient. As I said, the departments are working very hard to make sure that um, these opportunities become available to you, but it may not be so we can do other things. For example, some sites may allow the students work remotely um, as their own staff do. So we have to, as I said, we have to coordinate with those sites and we have to go with whatever plans those sites have and, and abide by their rules also. Uh, could you please uh, go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, another way would be uh, a virtual internship may be created in some program uh, where students are given, for example, case studies uh, to review and reflect upon and write about. Um, some programs, uh, especially at the undergraduate level, are modifying their curriculum and replacing the internship practicum requirements with other courses um, that, um, the other courses that might cover the material or the content that the students are supposed to be getting from their internship. So these are all different types um, of uh, internship that you might uh, be getting. So for your specific uh, internship, and if it is required for your program, uh, you do need to be in communication with the department because as I said, every one of them are different and you will be notified of all these information. Uh, for there are other deans that are on um, the call and uh, at the question answer session, we can answer any question you have about the specific cases. So thank you for this opportunity. And I uh, give the floor to the next presenter.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Kimberly McGee, and I would like to just uh, discuss how your uh, course schedule will look like um, this fall as you look in self-service banner. Um, if you take a look at this slide, this is just to walk you through how you would search for a course and leading up to what that course would actually look like so that you can identify an online course or on-campus course. And then we'll also take a look at a screenshot of how your course uh, schedule will look under the detailed um, student schedule in self-service banner. Next slide. So um, if you were in self-service banner through my EOL and you wanted to look up a class, um, you would start under registration and then go to uh, look up classes to add. Next slide. And then you would search for term, uh, by term, and obviously we're gonna start with the fall. And hit submit. Next slide. That will bring you to a listing of, well, there are a couple of slides before that. You would type in the course you're looking for. So let's say we're searching for a humanities course. And as you can see on this slide, what you see here, if you look all the way over to the right under the location, you will see any course that has actually a building and room number. That course will be offered face-to-face -face or in a hybrid format. And then if you come down, you'll be able to see that um, there is an abbreviation here, O-N-L-I, which is uh, the abbreviation for online. So if you see that listed there, that means your course that was originally scheduled for face-to-face -face this fall has been transitioned to an online course. Next slide. If you were to pull up your schedule now, um, if you pull up your schedule, the detailed student schedule will show you again um, the class information and then under the column where it says where, that online designation will be listed again there as well. It is also important to note that under days, um, as Dr. Rizé discussed, that um, classes, we have Saturday classes um, scheduled. You will now see an S and that S under days is uh, to denote Saturdays. And that has been added to all the classes. And so that is just important. I know there are lots of questions about why that S is showing up. So these changes, we're in the process of making these changes in Banner now and hope to have them all finalized by next Monday so that when you go in, everything will be listed very clearly there. And you will also note under the date range that the shortened semester is denoted there. So August 24th through November 24th are actually uh, the semester dates. And we are happy to answer questions again um, during the Q&A. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pfeiffer McGee. This is Joe Green with the University College. And our university prides itself on student success and achievement. As our wonderful chancellor mentioned to you earlier, and in keeping with Dean Rose and Dean Wilson, I want to share with you some of our academic enrichment and assist assistance services that we provide for our students. Um, and so one of our goals is to make sure our students are working through the university and taking advantage of all the great services we have. Those services include academic um, early intervention programming support, um, academic coaching and advising, um, academic tutoring, um, a new program that's called Target Review, which focuses on academic examinations and helping prepare students for that work, as well as supplemental instruction and uh, learning assistance accommodation um, to the Student Accessibility Services Office. I'd also like to add that all of these services that I just mentioned are not only services that one can receive, obviously face-to-face, -face, these are also services that the university provides in a virtual space. And so you might wanna, um, you might ask yourself, how will I do well academically? Well, we have a bevy of services that will help support you in getting the most out of your instruction along with working with your faculty um, and our great instructors. Could you move to the next slide, please? Um, we have an outstanding writing and speaking studio. So for those wonderful papers that you need to write, we work with you in that space to make sure that you can 
develop the most dynamic uh, work that you'd like to present. Um, we have a colleague on the line who can share with you about the resources that are provided by the library. 90% of the resources available through the library, you can reach through the virtual and online space. Um, we have individuals poised there, ready to support you in that space. Um, we also have academic skill building. Um, we create um, student success action plans. We will provide workshops and assistance programs throughout the fall. Um, and so I just want to make sure we express that. And I'm going to move on to my next colleague for Q&A. Good evening again. So as we uh, move into the question and answer session, I want to introduce the two individuals who are going to be moderating this session, and I'm going to do it from youngest to oldest. The youngest is Mr. Sean, Sean Coleman, who is the president of the Student Government Association. Uh, Mr. Coleman, can you say hi to the group? Hello, everyone. And also Dr. Russell Robinson, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Mass Communication. Good evening, everybody. We're looking forward to having you back in the fall. Okay, take it away. Okay, so before we get started, we just want to go ahead and again remind everyone that this is the time for you to put your questions in the chat box. We are more than happy to field those questions as soon as possible. But I want to go ahead and start off with a quick icebreaker, and I want to actually give this one to Dean Wilson. At the beginning of our presentation, you mentioned the topic of engaging with faculty, um, particularly at a distance or even in the hybrid model. Could you give us some best practices or examples of how students can engage with their professors at a distance? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Robinson. Well, clearly, when you are operating uh, in the online or hybrid Format, it's very important to stay into constant contact with your, with your instructor. Uh, and even doing face-to-face, -face, we should not assume that that's not also important. But uh, from day one, uh, if you're taking an online class, you must log in consistently when those times are scheduled. Uh, you should also keep in mind that although the course is being offered online, uh, the professors are still holding office hours. Uh, and so you should be in contact with your teacher during office hours, okay? When we take a look at the, when we evaluate online teaching and learning, one of the most significant issues that we encounter is this disconnect. Students may log in at the beginning of the semester, they may drift and disappear and come back at the end of the semester. Uh, and you know that that is not type of behavior that is really going to enhance I see that. in learning. So staying in constant contact, uh, sub submitting assignments, asking questions. Because in the online and hybrid format, it is not expected that you can disengage at the beginning and then come back at the end of class and just submit all of your work. So I think that's very, very important. And our instructors are also being advised and trained how to continue that type of contact and how to respond to questions and inquiries from their students. So that's, that's critical. Very good. Thank you. We have a question that actually came in from a student. A student states, I am a new transfer student. I do not know how to access my student email or who my advisor is to begin to register for classes. Where do I find that information? I think that's a catch-all. Or that might need to go to Dr. University College. Oh, University College, okay, thank you. Dr. Green? Yes, so um, we, that's where the student, the, the new transfer student in their first um, semester here, they will be working with us in the University College. So we have advisors that work with those students, as well as we do have a transfer office that works within enrollment, enrollment services as well. That's what we could support them. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so we have another question. Um, this is from, to all the panelists. Is the dynamic course schedule accurate on Banner? Right now, the dynamic course schedule 
um, shows all of my classes online, but my schedule shows all of my classes are still in person. Which one is correct? As stated, uh, this is Joyce Kavalik in the registrar's office. As stated by Ms. Kimberly Pfeiffer McGee, we are in the process of updating all of the courses that are relegated from online, from on campus to online, to no, to denote on your building and room, and uh, on the schedule that will denote online. And that, as Ms. Uh, Kimberly Pfeiffer McGee stated. Uh, we should have all of that completed and in place by Monday, uh, July the 17th, no, July the 20th. Okay, very good. I have another question. Uh, we have one that comes to us. Will the professors be required to use the same online platforms for virtual classes? And I'm assuming that we mean with that um, WebEx, Zoom, will they all be on the same platform? Could someone go into some detail with that? Yes, this is uh, Dean Wilson. All of our faculty are required to use the Blackboard platform. Uh, so no matter what they use to supplement their online instruction, they must use Blackboard. The, the university uh, provides the support for Blackboard. Our students familiar with it. Uh, our Office of E-Learning can respond very efficiently and quickly to any faculty member or student who may be having a stupid Blackboard. So everyone is required to use Blackboard. Now having said that, as we work our way through improving online instruction, certain courses do require uh, faculty and students to adapt to some additional instructional modes. For example, in some of our STEM areas, uh, the courses are supplemented with Labster, which is a program that helps with labs online. So uh, there are some instructors who will be using WebEx. WebEx is the university mode of communicating and holding meetings. Although there are others out there, uh, WebEx is the official one that we, we use. So we hope that there will be some focus in terms of the type of instructional technology. Okay, very good. We have a lot of questions coming in. And I'm going to go ahead and try to field some of the questions before. I'm going to turn this over to Sean. Sean, I think you got two questions you can raise. Yes. So the first question is, the classes that I am registered in for the fall are still showing as in-person, face-to-face classes. So does this mean that they will be face-to-face -face, or should we email the professors in case the registration information wasn't updated? So I think the question is asking, it's still showing that it's face-to-face. -face. Should students reach out to their professors to see if that's still accurate or should they um, just wait? Okay, so this is uh, Joyce Kavalik again. So again, I would recommend that the student check on by Monday to look on their schedule to see whether that has been changed to reflect online. And then if there are further questions, they can reach out to their professors. Okay, thank you. And then I have another question um, that was sent. Um, will professors be allowed to send out the syllabus prior to the start of fall semester so that students are fully aware and um, prepared for the way the course will be set up? Yes, you know, early communication is the key. So as soon as the schedules have been finalized, uh, we are advising uh, faculty to email students uh, particularly if they're going to be operating in a different format than the students actually expected. Uh, so if a class has been transitioned to online or if it has been transitioned to hybrid, uh, we are advising faculty to communicate to those students and to share with them exactly what does hybrid mean for that particular class and also to share the, the syllabi for online and hybrid courses as early as possible. Okay. Very good. I'm going to shift the focus of the conversation to more, I think, talking about um, the residence life portion of this. We have a question that comes to us, and the question raises this. If classes are moved to online, 
And if the classes are moved to online, if I can get first, hold on. I want to make sure I have that. Here we go. Let's go back. I, I, I think I see the question, uh, Russell. Okay, so can you address that for us? Because I think they would like to know about that one in particular. So I believe the question is, if classes are moved online, will we be required to stay on campus? The deadline to cancel housing is July 15th. We won't know if our classes are online by then. Um, I I do believe that you'll know if the classes are online, correct? Um, Provost Anderson and George. Okay, so if they're not finished till Monday, then we'll have to revisit. I just got that word. Uh, we probably then move the cancellation deadline for housing. Um, but yeah, right now our plan is to still have students, you know, residing on campus. There's no plan right now um, for students to not be on campus. So um, we'll make sure that our date for housing cancellation will align with the date where your classes will be available. Right. To see. I'm sorry. I wanted to follow up with another one. So if a student tests positive for coronavirus, are they expected to remain on campus? If so, how are they expected to continue with their classes and how will they proceed? So I will speak to that as Dr. Coleman. If a student tests positive and they are a resident in housing, they will be moved to our isolation quarantine facility, uh, which has currently been designated on campus. And of course, we will also work with the provost and associate vice provost, our dean of students, to facilitate the students to still continue um, their work if they are physically healthy enough to do so. So if they are not, then we would also work with the students to facilitate um, that process. But if a student is, let's say, asymptomatic and in the quarantine or isolation space, we would make sure that they have the proper access, you know, the technology to still continue their courses and we will work directly with the faculty. Very good. We have another question that I think talks about CDC. The student raised the question, based on the CDC recommendations for students that have asthma, what are some of the strategies to keep the students healthy and safe um, during this time? So what are some of the strategies I guess we need to take, or what are the strategies that we're taking as far as if students already have pre-existing conditions. In this case, the student mentioned asthma. And I think they also go into the notion of uh, where, what are the strategies to keep the students safe in NCCU, including housing? So I'll just kind of break that question down. If there is a student that has a pre-existing condition or they are in a high risk category, we do have a process in place through our Student Accessibility Services Office for students to make requests for accommodations um, if they plan to live on campus if a student is residing on campus we had this discussion during the town hall two weeks ago and we also have a res life town hall tomorrow so log into that one for more specific information but we'll be having students will be required of course to do um, a daily health screening that they will have to complete um, students will be required to wear masks we've already talked about that you know they'll be required to wear those in the classroom as well as anywhere outside of their housing facility um, outside of their room um, students will be seeing signs all in the residence halls about social distancing. Um, there will be limits to the lounges um, and the capacity in those lounges to make sure that social distancing um, is followed. And, you know, in addition to that, there'll be hand sanitizers, you know, everywhere. We're going to be controlling the entryways and the exits and how that traffic flow works in the residence halls with the elevators and going in and out of the building. There will be no visitation um, in the fall. We've already spoken about that in the last town hall. We can get a little bit more into detail about that tomorrow. But for this particular student, it sounds like they may have some health conditions. I would ask for them to work with us student accessibility services. And there is a form through our Accommodate um, software that the student can complete to request accommodations. So that would be my recommendation. Sean, I'm going to turn it over to you. I think you've got some questions over there. Okay, so my next question, um, in studying for certain exams and tests, um, what will be the capacity limit for the library? Um, thank you very much for that question. Um, what we are doing now is we, we have several, many spaces for collaboration. However, we, due to the COVID um, 
situation we are reducing those spaces what we are trying to do in person keeping the spaces to two people at a time and in other if groups need to meet larger than two we are promoting and encouraging vo- uh, virtual collaboration thank you um the next question is in regards to saturday classes some students are asking what if um the saturday classes in my student schedule, class schedule, are at the same time? Um, As I mentioned before, the Saturday classes don't actually meet. So there is no specific meeting in any format for Saturday classes. You will receive uh, information, instructional information, lectures, or um, assignments. You will receive those uh, from your instructor. So you can schedule your Saturday as however it uh, fits um, your needs. Um, and the information about how those materials and what kind of materials for each Saturday will be sent to you will be on your syllabus and the professors will inform you of that. We have a question that is talking about performance-based classes, workshops, recitals, and so forth. How are they going to be run? while taking head, um, taking, I guess, social distance protocols. How are we going to do those types of classes? Yes, this is uh, Dean Wilson. Uh, In the departments of uh, music and theater, of course, you have a lot of performance-based classes. uh, And they are currently working out plans based upon enrollment in certain types of courses in the physical space. If these classes are meeting face-to-face or in a hybrid type of format, they are being moved to large venues that can safely accommodate the number of students who need to be enrolled in that particular class. Uh, These departments are following best practices in terms of what's going on at universities all across the country in regards to recitals, musical performances, music-based classes, theater, Uh, to figure out how to best do this. But clearly, uh, looking for a large enough space to safely accommodate students so types of courses can continue to be uh, conducted properly. We have a similar question that talks about the synchronous versus asynchronous questions, or classes, excuse me. Um, If a class is synchronous, will the days and times they meet be obvious when they register? So if I have a Tuesday, Thursday at one o'clock and I choose to make that synchronous when I'm online, are we still gonna be meeting during that time? I think is the question. Yes, that's the exact definition of synchronous. So if it's synchronous, then there would be a a specific meeting, just like if you go in the classroom, you're gonna go on Blackboard or Zoom or WebEx, whatever uh, platform is determined, and uh, the course will be conducted at that time. There won't be any flexibility. Uh, Now, as opposed to asynchronous, which is the Saturday classes, there won't be any specific meeting time uh, for meeting. So the material or the lecture will be posted and the students can access the lectures and the material on their own time. Could you go into some more detail, I guess, with the asynchronous type of class? Because I think in that case, we probably want to go ahead and I think try to break this down, what the student responsibilities will be for an asynchronous class. The student's responsibility will be to uh, get the material. So as I mentioned, for each one of the classes, uh, it will be listed on the syllabus. Uh, Let's say, for example, you have a um, biology class and they say that on each Saturday, you're going to have uh, either a lecture or an assignment. And when those lecture and assignment, like at eight o'clock that Saturday, the lecture will be posted. So the students will be responsible to um, access the platform where the material are going to be posted and take those material. If it's a lecture, they need to read it, review it, um, post questions to the professor about it. If it's assignment, then they need to do the assignment just like any other assignment that contact the professor, submit the assignment or ask more questions. So responsibility of the student is to know uh, and find out. And as I said, it will be listed on the syllabus. So it should be very obvious 
where and in what uh, format those material are going to be posted. So that's the, it would be the responsibility of the students to get the material and uh, perform whatever uh, is asked of them. So Provost, this might be one for you or one for one of the deans. The student raises the question, when will the student receive a final update on when, whether their class will be face-to-face, -face, online, or hybrid? So as Dr. Ms. Kamalik mentioned, all those changes should be shown in Banner by the first of next week. So um, they just have to stay tuned, but everything should be finalized in Banner SSB um, showing on the student schedule by Monday of next week. Okay, so the date is really, we're looking for next week, Monday, things should be ready. That's, that's the target, according to Ms. Kamalik, and I trust what she said. Okay. Sean, I think you have a couple of questions. Yes. So students ask, um, how will clinicals and internships be um, handled, as well as labs? Well, clinical, as I um, mentioned, uh, if you recall, the clinicals and internships are very specific to each program. And uh, the departments make the determination of how it's going to be done. So they are making the plans right now, and they will communicate those plans to the students. So it could be, as I said, um, they could have a regular internship like they've always had before, um, or it could be, and they go, they go to the site um, in person. It could be that they have a regular internship, but they have to do the work uh, remotely. Some departments are making changes to the curriculum. Um, and uh, changing the material that needs to be covered. So it, as I said, it's very specific to each program. And the students can, they will get the information about these uh, courses, um, but if they, you know, if they want to know now, they should contact the departments to find out more specific information, contact their advisors. I want to follow up with that one too, if I can, because I think this is related to the question you raised, Sean. We have a student that also talked about the same question, but now they're talking about it through the lens of a high school student. In fact, they say, what assistance will be offered to cater to the needs of students who participate in early college or the high school, especially the heavy courses such as physics and uh, physics with labs and calculus? Well, I mean, there is a lot of thought going into uh, STEM programs in terms of uh, particularly labs. And I think students will find that many of those STEM classes will be hybrid, where lectures will be offered online, but labs could be face-to-face -face, uh, with the proper distancing. So these various departments are working to uh, clearly determine how many students can be updated in a lab uh, according to the proper guidelines. Now, in addition to that, and I think this is something that, uh, you know, we are very proud of, you know, there's been a lot of progress made in offering labs online. The uh, mm -hmm. university has acquired additional software uh, that will allow professors to effectively teach labs online. There are online modules that were used when we had to pivot in March that have proven to be very effective. So therefore, when it comes to the labs in many of the STEM areas, there'll be a variety of approaches. In our physics classes, level classes, where the numbers tend to be smaller, uh, there may be some based labs as well, in, in chemistry as well. Uh, however, there will be a mixture of online approaches in order to uh, effectively teach our labs. Okay. We have a question, which is a big question. It talks about commencement. The spring commencement was canceled and the students were told that they could participate in the fall commencement. Will there be a ceremony in the fall? <laughs> the answer is that yes, we are planning to have a fall commencement. Of course, a lot of this depends on what happens with the coronavirus, but at this point, the intent is to have a commencement and there is a date 
in December. I don't remember exactly which date it is. So all I can say is stay tuned to that. But yes, we are planning to have a fall commencement ceremony. A provost um, is Friday, December the 4th is what's scheduled on the calendar. Okay, thanks, Ms. Kavala. Sean, I think you've got some questions. Yes. So one um, question that was sent, I have, someone said, I have a concerned parent that wants me to take all my classes online. Is that possible as a senior? Well, I think that this may vary across the across the campus, and perhaps uh, the provost and some of the other deans can can comment. But uh, classes are being structured, and as we mentioned earlier, uh, a class can land in one or three areas: face to face, hybrid, or on online. Uh, and once that course is set to be offered. Uh, students will may not have the option of taking it through some other mode unless there are some very extenuating circumstances that's dealing with accessibility uh, and things of that of that of that nature. Uh, so, uh, you know, once these schedules are, are set, we hope that uh, a student will land in the proper place. Uh, we think that that will be the case in in most instances. Uh, but extenuating circumstances uh, will be will be dealt with. Um, and just to reiterate what Dean Wilson said, the ability to take all the classes online um, as a senior really depends on what your major um, is, your major course of study, and also what courses that what courses are remaining for you to complete your degree but work closely with your advisor and your department chair to make sure if you change your schedule that you don't set yourself back in terms of your time to graduation. Because your parents love you, but your parents want you to graduate. Sean, you have a question that's going to talk about professor expectations. Yes. So um, one of the questions is, will there be expectations of professors and instructors to put in grades much sooner because we're operating predominantly online? Dean? Dean? Speak up now. Don't get quiet now. Carlton? You're muted. Can you, can you repeat the question, please? I didn't quite catch it all. Yes. So the question was, will there be expectations for professors and instructors to put in grades sooner because we're operating on um, majority online? I mean, there are extremely high expectations that professors do uh, every aspect of online uh, instruction at the highest level uh, from um, the preparation it takes in actually getting their course up to having it placed in Blackboard in a way that is extremely efficient, detailed, uh, and comprehensible with students, communicating with students, interacting with students, and especially uh, grading uh, assignments and posting assignments so students will know throughout the semester where they stand. Uh, the Office of E-Learning is doing job uh, in helping faculty create extremely efficient and high quality courses uh, and that communication part of that is very important and of course that includes you know letting the student know where they stand in terms of evaluation the, high, the expectations are very high and following up on that I think would it be a, let me ask the dean or even faculty members on the team, could you please go into some detail about the use of office hours during this time? Because office hours, I find, are very critical to student success. Yeah, so this is John Gant, the Dean of the School Library and Information Sciences. So I'll kind of answer both questions too, because it's important because both go hand in hand with this whole 
strategy of how we can really do a great job of engaging with the student. What's really nice about Blackboard, for example, is that it has a really good grade book. And in there, it's not only can give you the grades, but you can actually get very good detailed feedback about each assignment. Uh, the rubrics can be included in there uh, and so forth. Um, and then also office hours. Uh, faculty members will have to uh, set up virtual office hours. And at the School Library of Information Science, we do it in three different ways. One, uh, you know, they'll set up a, uh, an appointment and we'll set up a, you know, a phone call you know, with the student. Um, secondly, we'll use WebEx or Zoom or, um, or even Blackboard Collaborate, which is the video link inside of Blackboard. Uh, we'll use that for individuals or for groups uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, thirdly, um, the other option for uh, doing office hours is doing group types of office hours. If there's some common questions with uh, students, um, they'll set up group meetings uh, as a way of, of holding office hours. Too. So they'll do it individually and also, you know, using the learning platforms. Uh, as a way of, of doing that. So, um, but yeah, look at it as if you were going to visit a, um, you know, a, a doctor or somebody where you make an appointment. It, that's really what office hours are going to look like. Um, but I find that faculty members will set up office hours, you know, from you know, like one to four on Mondays and Wednesdays. They'll set up appointments. Um, our, uh, our, you know, our, our student engagement tool can help set up those kinds of appointments uh, as well. And then another way they can also help if you send in questions, they can always make sure they send in uh, email responses. And that list we try and respond within 24 hours. So I know a lot of faculty members are trying to implement those types of plans as they go forward as they're working with the Office of E-Learning to really make a much more highly engaged type of um, experience um, for students. Thank you, Dr. Gant. Dr. Wiley, you're a member of, well, you're a faculty who has lived the experience of uh, being on the faculty. Are you there? Could you give us just, I guess, what you would also expect as a member of the faculty for students now in our new normal? She may not be with us. Uh, Dr. Weimer, are you there? No worries. So. <laughs> This is Anthony Nelson, okay. uh, the School of Business. Dr. And Nelson. I'd like to quickly add on to the uh, first question. Um, in terms of expectations, the, the, the short answer is yes, we do expect faculty members to enter the grades on time. Um, secondly, we have a process uh, which by which we can identify faculty members who do not submit their grades on time. And <laughs> Once we identify those faculty members, we're able to follow up with them uh, and let them know that they must submit their grades uh, uh, quick, fast, and in a hurry. Uh, faculty members may not submit their grades for a variety of reasons. Um, one reason might be that they thought the student was not going to be graduating uh, as opposed, and, and therefore did not submit their grades for the graduating. So, um, regardless of the reason, we do contact those faculty members if they do not submit grades on time. And again, I guess a reasonable expectation for faculty to return emails or correspondence to the students, certainly within 48 on the outside, but preferably 24 hours. Is that correct? Is that a good uh, estimate? For faculty? That's returns. a good estimate. Okay, okay. Sean, you've got some questions for us in regards to finances. Why don't you go ahead and take that away? Sean, your mic. So one of the questions that was raised, um, will tuition be adjusted to reflect the changes in course delivery? Um, good evening. This is Akua Matherson. Um, the tuition is being adjusted based on whether you are taking face-to-face um, -face courses or um, distance education instruction uh, based on the number of hours methodology that has been used in previous um, semesters. If you are taking all online courses, you will be charged um, the DE or distance learning rate only. However, if you are um, 
uh, noted as an on-campus student still pay the required fee of uh, education and technology student activity, those, those regular fees. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Sean, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Um, and then also another question that students have been um, asking are um, in regard to all of this, um, can we clarify when students can expect reading that Hold on for a second. We have a couple of live mics out there. I'm going to ask if you to pause or mute those live mics. Go ahead and have you ask that question again, Sean. Okay. So a few students have been concerned about refund checks and when will those be distributed? So the refund um, schedule will be the same as it always is, which is I believe the first refunds come, um, I think five days after the first day of class, but uh, the refund schedule has been published, um, but we will make sure that that information is emailed to all current and students who are, there's a slightly different schedule for new students or freshmen that come in um, and I'm not sure if Dr. Alexander, um, I'm sorry, not Alexander, Dr. Oliver is on the line with scholarships and student aid because I know she probably has the schedule committed to memory. Okay. And just so we're on top of the time, I want to let everyone know that we've got roughly 10 more minutes. So 10 more minutes to get your questions. If you can't get them tonight, uh, there will be a Q&A slide or be a section or FAQ posted also with this uh, meeting. I've got a couple of questions from some of our students at the early college. And there's students are duly enrolled in early college. The building is not open. Will they be able to be on campus for the classes? Good, af good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Michelle Mayo, and I serve as the Associate Provost for Academic Programs and Undergraduate Research, and I work with the, the NCCU Liaison affiliated with the Early College. In terms of the, the building being unlocked, that's a question that um, Dr. Woods Weeks will have to answer at that time, because from our understanding, Durham Public Schools will be online as far as the high schools are concerned. So what we have been instructed in working in unison with the high school is that all instruction will be online. Therefore, it is our expectation that there will be no students on campus. But um, that's a question that Dr. Gloria Woods Weeks would be able to answer better than we can at this time because she serves as the principal. And at this time, we really do not know what the guidelines or policies or restrictions that Dr. Woods Weeks will be following in terms of people being present in the, in the high school. Thank you. We have a question that is from one of our, I would say from one of our um, non-traditional students. They say, I am an adult learner with four school-age children who will more than likely be online in the IGNITE program in DPS. Will professors be encouraged to work with those students uh, with children uh, who will be obviously doing some type of homeschooling? Well, Dr. Robinson, I think as a member of the faculty, you may be able to respond to that. <laughs> Gee, Dean Wilson, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you one. Uh, no, I, I, here's the thing. I will say this as a member of the faculty and as a former faculty member, uh, faculty senate chair. The one thing that we want to make sure that we do to our students is we understand that deadlines, especially during this time, are not completely sketched in stone. Again, our goal is to make sure that students do, regardless of where they are, we want to make sure that we are partners in their success. So I would like to say that I would hope that my fellow colleagues would really take this opportunity to really step up and actually demonstrate a higher level of empathy than we've ever had to do. These are different times. We understand that. We understand that, yes, I'm a parent myself, and my son will also more than likely be in the Ignite program. But I also am empathetic, but I'm also realistic. So if there's a deadline that 
we can move, I'm more than happy to do that. I think our colleagues want to do that. Um, this is the moment that we are not going to leave any students behind. And I think I can say that uh, for my colleagues who are not here with us, but our goal is to make sure that we get you from graduate or get you to destination graduation as smoothly as possible, especially during this time. It, this is John again. I also want to add to that. Remember that all the classes now have a Blackboard complement to each of them as well, too. And so any of the li any of the sessions that are done online can be recorded and can be viewed later. Uh, you can work with your faculty member, your instructor, to say, "Hey, I've got the situation. You know, can we make an accommodation? I need may need to be asynchronous for you know these number of classes or for this particular class because of the situation." So earlier, Dean Rose said one of the key components to help both of you know the faculty side and the student side really be successful is good open communication about what's going on. And the way that we're moving and we have Blackboard associated with every class, it is easier to record the sessions, uh, to have some asynchronous learning to go along with the, the live sessions too. But just remember, you, it is your responsibility as, as the Chancellor said, to really make sure that you engage and you let your faculty member know what's going on in your class in case you do need to make those types of accommodations. Thank you, Dean Gant. We have a question in regards to our graduate student population. The student raised the question about graduate assistantships. Will graduate assistantships be expected to be in person or online as well? Um, both. Uh, so we um, have, as each department that has uh, assistantships or um, awards assistantships, they will um, have the students work like the faculty and staff. So if the assistantship is a teaching assistantship and they're working with the faculty, if the course is online, and uh, then they were going to be doing the work online. If the assistantship is some kind of research, the students can do that on their own <clears throat> and uh, remotely. So we do encourage most of the work to be done remotely. But if uh, anything that needs to be done in the lab, then it will be based on the regulations uh, that are set up for that lab, for the research. So we'll just go with the assistantship will be treated just like any other work on campus. We get faculty work or staff work. And we will follow those regulations that is set by the university. Do we have anyone else who wants to address that question? Very good. Well, folks, I want to thank you so much for your questions on behalf of Sean and myself. Uh, we really have had a rather robust conversation with you, and I'm quite confident there will be further conversations. At this time, I'm going to turn it back over to our interim provost, one of the best provosts in the state, the madam provost, the provost of provosts, uh, Dr. Anderson, and she will close us out. Now you should know, Russell, that's not how you gain favor. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Actually, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Anderson, if I may, and there were some questions, some other questions from the graduate students. Uh, one was about so, uh, comps, thesis, and proposals. Uh, the so, deadline so, for Dr. So, 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 yes. So. I'm going to ask, and I was going to address that. There are some questions in the chat that have not been answered, and I want to let know those who are participating know that those questions will be referred to the, the individuals who um, can answer those questions. We are a host of the Division of Student Affairs and we are over time and I don't want to make enemies in student affairs. So um, we will make sure that uh, I think they can give you a list of the students on the call yeah. or that information can put, be put in the Q&A. Um, document that will be available to, to all the students on this call so that they can answer, they can get the answers and we'll make sure they get your phone number, et cetera. I do want to thank all of you for um, being on the call to listen and to hear um, inwardly digest, as they say, the information. We hope that we haven't created more questions than answers. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who served as panelists and took your time and energy um, to answer the call and answer the questions. Thank you so very much. And with that, we're going to say 
I guess we're saying good evening, and we look forward to meeting you either virtually or in person in the fall. Thank you so very much, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Good evening. Okay, bye-bye.